Was H.P. Lovecraft an occultist or someone who was actually practicing in the magical arts? Yeah, I think he was. But I think it was a complicated thing in terms of why he was brought to that level. Now, he's, he's had a catastrophic childhood. By any standards, you know, it was a horror story. His father died of syphilis, and I often wonder if his xenophobia, which really isn't as bad as it's made out to be, it's more like immaturity, because he had loads of friends who were members of ethnic groups like Irish and Jews and stuff. He couldn't, he allegedly hated, but he actually, it, 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 like anything else in life, it was not a black and white thing. Now, eh... Uh, the father may have gotten syphilis and may have been cursed. And here's the thing. In a family that's been cursed, sometimes one of the kids will either deliberately or instinctually be drawn towards sorcery and magic and occultism as a way to try and offset either instinctually or knowingly the family curse. And I think that was the, what drove Lovecraft in his early youth. Uh, in his boyhood, he was very, you know, intelligent, well-read, and articulate, and knowledgeable, and in, and he probably almost certainly had access to Mister Grandpa Phillips Freemasonic Library, where there would have been occult books because that would have been central to a New England gentleman's life at that period. And I, his nervous breakdown during his late teens was probably a result of having summoned an entity. And uh, one of the problems is that many of the people who write about Lovecraft is, you see, we have to remember what we're dealing, we're dealing out of space time. You can't compare it with the space time reality that we live in. It's not like that at all. The night gods that haunted him as a child may well have been entities from the future he summoned coming back to try and disrupt them in his childhood. Remember, these entities live outside our space-time reality. There's absolutely no way the Cthulhu mythos could have been just invented. It's too perfect. It's too close to reality. It foretells the future. It's, it's just too close to de demonology. It's I mean, it's just there's so many things relevant to, like, you know, religious and spiritual Gnosticism inside it. Things that he claimed to dislike and hate and couldn't stand. And yet here he was, in a fictional sense, going about them. The, uh, the names that he does use are entities. Some of them are entities and angels and stuff in some of the rituals. Now, there's, there was loads of occultic stuff he could have got his hands on. But his was too sophisticated. Remember, the stuff that the likes of the the Golden Dawn and all that bunch give you is not the real thing. It's That's, that's, that's cosplay, more or less. It's, and... The real stuff is like what I experienced in that house, that, 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 that you know, that, that, that dream or whatever it is I have at the house. That's the real thing. You have to remember that Lovecraft's beings are not, they're not evil. What's evil is humanity's reaction towards them. You, that's, you know, you, you have a choice whether to go mad, commit suicide with, by morphine, kill yourself, hang yourself, die of fright. If you encountered, you know, the Dagon cult or Cthulhu or, you know, the Marsh look, the uh, the Innsbruck look. And, sorry, the, <laughs> uh, the in, Innsmouth look, but Innsbruck. Yeah, uh, but, uh, hmm. but it's not, it's not the entities that do the killing or the hurting. It's the reaction the people destroy themselves. And it's almost like this was Lovecraft's uh, psychoanalysis of having damaged himself in somehow by channeling entities. Another one to consider is the Jungian aspects of, if you read my book Sorcery, I talk about, you know, the 
that I was this close to doing the invocation of the Great Cthulhu as a joke at, up the road, Creevy Keel Court Cairn, which is beside the ocean. It was just felt right. There was a cyclopean monolith. There was me. It was magic. There was Lovecraft. Here we go. But it was just, it was just a joke in my head. But it wasn't later on. I thought about it. In the first of the what they call the Cthulhu Mythos, <laughs> Dagon. Um, this guy who escapes from a German, is German. He's a POW. He escapes from the German captains at sea. And he ends up finding himself on an island that was a piece of the seabed that's been brought to the surface. Now, there's just the, the Jungian things there are tremendous. And that's also a very possible analogy to the things that Lovecraft brought up from the subconscious well, during his own occult experimentation. And he may, er, he may well have known he was doomed. This is probably why he didn't go and get treatment for his cancer at the end. This is... It, it, Lovecraft stuff is so far ahead of its time it's it cannot be a result of just mere imagination or fiction it's either a grimoire predicting foretelling the future or it's someone who had shamanic insights and I believe he was a reluctant shaman the he, look at the things like he, the whole idea of this found footage that you saw in the Blair Witch. He invented that that when that that idea of somebody finding papers and then reliving the story, like in the Call of Cthulhu. He invented that. I mean, all, all the all the every all our ideas of fantasy, dark gothic superhero things like Batman, everything it all comes directly from him. It all comes from him, and. He obviously put so much emotion into his work because he wrote a hundred thousand... Although he wasn't a proficient writer, I think The Colour of Space took something like five years to write. That's been made into a movie, I believe, at the moment. The, the, the incredible, voluminous um, intensity of his letter writing was magic. He was putting so much focus into it. And his followers and the people who continued his work are just like, you know, religious disciples. They're like his monks. Arkham House is almost like it was on became a church. Derelict became his high priest on earth after he had moved on. These things don't happen unless there's a real magical or occult aspect to them. They just don't. And his work is, I, you know... I have absolutely no, you know, these people who who invoke or channel Lovecraftian entities, I totally understand that they are, a, you know, you can put enough force and will into anything to make it come to life. And I've no doubt that in years to come, it, not only will it be a magical system, the Cthulhu mythos, but it will actually be seen as a spiritual or religious tradition. Lovecraft is now a god, or on the point, on the cusp of becoming a god. And with his godhood will become religious devotion. I mean, I've almost got a religious devotion to him in a way, to his work. Uh, I just, I just every so often will just pick up, you know, like I was reading The Hunter in the Dark, a collection of short stories, and just be, when you read those stories, they're, you, you know, you, the, the pictures in your, eye, in your mind's eye don't only just, uh, come alive they be, they are alive the descriptions of buildings the descriptions of sensations I mean a story like the colour out of space what is it it's just it's just a colour that's indescribable that infects an, it's an alien force which infects the land and infects the, the the environment around it we're talking about the 1920s we're talking about you know a level of sophistication that could not be accidental and the only thing that you can that you can compare it to at the same period is occultic writing. That's it, uh, magic and and magical traditions. That's it. and the like. What likes of Crowley was coming out as well as things like Jungian uh, philosophy. The artwork that he has inspired from a simple sketch of Cthulhu, a remarkable world of art has come about. Derelith horror art eldritch sorry eldritch horror art and it's arkham is a real place 
Uh, Innsmouth is a real place. Uh, I I I feel like Innsmouth is on the coast of New England with the and the old you know the closed down Boston and Main Railway is still there. That bus with the uh, people of Innsmouth look and they're tiny. I, that's that to me is real. Just like Cthulhu was real. Just like the bloop that was heard at the bottom of the ocean, exactly where he's in Rael is where he's dead but dreaming is real. We're now obsessed with the Antarctic. The Antarctic is melting. People are talking about ancient civilizations under the ice of the Antarctica. And then we have like the Mountains of Madness where he wrote about this in the in the thirties, in the twenties. It's it's so incredible. It's it's just it's it's beyond the bounds of possibility. It is it is it's magic, it is sorcery, it is shamanism. And we can look at this two ways. There was a curse on the family, perhaps, we don't know. Or he was cursed himself for opening portals that he wasn't supposed to portal. Or he was so in denial of his own ability as a as a seer, as a shaman, as a magician, whatever you want to call him, that it tore him up inside. Uh, this absolutely, you know, uh, this whole man of science thing, this is very easy to rationalise away. Oh, he was a Mr. Man. But there's lots of people who say one thing, but inside their feelings they have another. And, it, it you know... It, Deep down inside, we're a different person than what we present to the public when it comes to things that we're afraid people will, will embarrass us all by. And among the his desire to be among the respectable classes in the literary scene, he will he would not want the, that of the god out. And it's it you know the way his life was was almost a classic example of either someone cursed or someone in denial of themselves and it eats them up and tears them to pieces. You can always tell when someone is in denial of themselves. They're extremely unhappy. Uh, they, they're they not happy. They're, they're, they're not. You can tell it's like someone is in a relationship and they're happy. They're happy. They're not obsessed with the past. They're not obsessed with other things. That they're, they're focused on that. It's the same with someone who's in a job. If they're really happy in the job, they're focused on their career and their job. They're not hating it. They, but deep down inside they will. And just like the person that's in denial of their life, where it's gone or how it's ending up, will be torn to pieces inside. And it will explode to the surface just like the landmass coming up from the bottom of the ocean south of the equator in Dagon. And this is Lovecraft's true ability as a seer, as a, as a shaman. His amazing ability to express the repressed aspects of the human spiritual and psyche through by means of fictional horror and fantasy and science fiction stories. You, that's the thing. People read, oh, they're great stories, oh, anything. But they, your, your subconscious mind is reading that story in a different way. It's a lot of poetry. It's like, little William Blake's poetry is like that. It's, it's sort of like the, the poem, like Ghost of the Fleet, it's delivered on one level, but it's, it's your subconscious mind is reading it on another. And that's, that's magic. That's, that's, you know, Crowley's poetry is full of that stuff. You know, and Celia Farts isn't just about Celia Farting. And uh, the allegory, you know, people say to me, how do I start beginning in a magical state? How do I, how do, I do that? You begin by the, the incorporation of the richness and the meaningful specialness of allegory and metaphor. And that switches off your, con well, it doesn't switch off your conscious minds, but it throws you into a state where you're more receptive to visionary f sensations and the observation you know people say we only have we only see with one percent of our perception well the, the five senses do but the subconscious mind sees with a much wider thing and the, you know this is why we've we've lost a sense of free association if you can see with the subconscious mind or communicate with the conscious subconscious mind you see much more of the universe you don't physically see it you you are engaged with it, and therefore you can tap into its power. Uh, your daemon becomes the interface between the subconscious and the conscious, and that becomes the hidden voice. And my God, did Lovecraft have one hell of a daemon? 
I don't, he's so powerful that he's not even dead to me. He's in this car with me right now. He's at work with me. He's at the house with me. He goes on holiday with me. It's almost like I feel him all the time. And it's a power force in the world that's only growing. And why? Because whether he wanted it, believe it or not, whether he knew it deep down inside or not, whether he was in denial or not, Lovecraft was a magician.